The meeting of the committee will please come to order. In February, President Obama called upon the Congress to enact legislation to reform America's health care system. In April, Governor, Governor Kathleen Sebelius was sworn in as Secretary of Health and Human Services. Her department has the lead responsibility for improving the health of the American people. Last Friday, I joined with Chairman Rangel and Chairman Miller and Chairman Emeritus Dingell to propose a discussion draft on health reform. This morning, we have the honor of hearing Secretary Sebelius present the administration's views on the discussion draft. Based on her contributions today and on what we will hear and learn from the 50 stakeholders appearing before the Health Subcommittee this week, and on the input from the members, we will revise the discussion draft and introduce a bill for consideration by the three committees. Our legislation will reduce health care costs. It will cover all Americans. It will improve the quality of care, and it will be fully paid for. The lead sponsor, the lead author, will be John Dingell, Chairman Emeritus of this committee, who has faithfully carried on his father's legacy as an undisputed leader in the struggle for health reform. I want to emphasize a few important points about the discussion draft. First, it is just that, a draft for legislation, uh, for discussion for the legislation. We are seeking input from the administration and others because we want to improve the draft before introducing legislation. Second, the draft builds on what works in our unique, uniquely American system. It builds on the employer-based system for providing health coverage to workers and their dependents. It relies on and improves Medicare as the source of health coverage for the elderly and the disabled. It builds upon Medicaid to extend coverage to low-income Americans. Third, the draft fixes what is broken. It fixes the broken individual health insurance market by creating a new insurance exchange through which uninsured Americans can enroll in their choice of health care plan. Those who cannot afford to purchase the coverage available in the exchange will receive assistance. A public opinion, excuse me, a public option will be available within the insurance exchange to give consumers an alternative to private health insurers for their health care coverage. This public option will be self-supporting, will not receive ongoing subsidies from uh, the federal government. The uh, public option will compete. No one is obligated to sign up for the public option. No provider is obligated to provide medical services under the public option. But the public option will provide competition so that we can make the market work and keep everybody honest. The draft contains provisions to reduce rural racial and ethnic disparities in disease, incident, and treatment. The draft fixes the broken Medicare physician payment system and prevents the irrational cuts that are scheduled under current law from going into effect. The draft takes the steps necessary to fix the shortage of primary care practitioners and nurses and other uh, providers. And finally, the draft ensures that people have a choice, choice of doctors, choice of benefits packages, and choice among insurance plans. This approach builds on what works and fixes what's broken and makes sure that people have choices. It's pragmatic, and it will produce the results the nation's health care system so desperately needs, lower costs, broader coverage, and better quality. Today, we'll continue on a journey that began over 100 years ago to provide health insurance for all Americans. Some of our greatest presidents of the 20th century, Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and Harry Truman, were advocates for health insurance for all Americans. President Clinton fought hard for his administration's proposal. Those initiatives may have failed, but the hope that inspired them was never defeated. The time has finally come to redeem that hope and to deliver 
true health reform. In my conversations with colleagues and constituents, I'm getting the clear sense that there is now a willingness to tackle this issue and to resolve the problems and bring forward a much better health care system for all Americans. With President Obama in the White House, we now have the best opportunity ever to enact health reform. I'm determined that we not let this opportunity slip from our grasp. I look forward to this morning's testimony and continue with urgent pragmatism to send health reform legislation to the President for his signature this year. I want to recognize um, for an opening statement the ranking uh, Republican member of the committee, Mr. Barton. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you and I earlier this year attended the um, several White House health care summits. Uh, at those summits, both in the large meetings and in the um, working group meetings, I said that the uh, Republicans in the House and the Republicans on this committee were very ready and very willing to work with the President, with you, you and Mr. Pallone and other members of the majority to create a uh, new health care system for America. Uh, there is no member of Congress on either side of the aisle uh, that is opposed to improvements and reforms in our current health care system. So we were ready to work. Uh, you told me repeatedly that you were ready to work with myself and the other Republicans. Uh, having said that, uh, actions speak louder than words. While you and I have held several meetings, personal meetings, and we held one meeting with Chairman Pallone and Ranking Member Deal of the subcommittee, we agreed to work together. Uh, the brown bag lunch that was supposed to occur because of that uh, was scheduled and rescheduled. And finally, last week, we were supposed to have it, have had it last Friday at noon, we were called the afternoon before and said that that brown bag lunch on a bipartisan basis could not be scheduled because you were attending a press conference to unveil the Democratic health care bill. Um, that's not bipartisanship. That's not inclusiveness. Um, it, sure, it sure made me feel like the uh, young woman who was being wooed by a young man, and the young man kept promising to take her out on a date, and he finally called her up and said, well, I know we had a date tomorrow, but I can't do it because I'm getting married to somebody else. Um, I guess there's some people that do both, but uh, still love <laughs> luckily you're not one of them, and I'm not either. But it is what it is. So we now have a bill. We've got the Secretary of Health and Human Services here to probably wax eloquent in support of your bill. I haven't read her testimony, but I bet it's going to be supportive. Um, the good news is we are we're going to have a series of hearings, and we will uh, at some point in time go to markup. Hope springs eternal on our side uh, that some of our ideas uh, may yet be included. Um, the bill in its current form I have not read all 852 pages of it. I'm not going to fib about that, but I've seen summaries, and it's a massive government involvement in Americans' health care. It's hugely expensive. I've seen estimates as high as $3 trillion over 10 years. Uh, I'm told that the word shall is mentioned over 1,300 times. I'm told that there are 38 new mandates that there are dozens of new bureaucracies. Uh, I listened to your opening statement, Mr. Chairman, and heard you say that nobody has to take the government plan who doesn't want it. That may well be true, technically, but if you put so many mandates uh, on private insurance that it becomes cost prohibitive, and if you raise the, uh, the Medicaid eligibility to 400 percent, um, there are going to be millions of Americans that lose their coverage because the private businesses uh, that offer it can't afford it, and then there are going to be millions of Americans who say, why should I pay a monthly premium of X dollars when I can go on Medicaid and pay little or nothing? You know, the short of it is that uh, if your bill were to become law, uh, we wouldn't have much of a private health care system in America. 
uh, within 10 to 20 years. So putting me down is undecided, Mr. Chairman. Um, we will work with you. We have a number of amendments. We have a Republican alternative that's private sector based, uh, lets the individuals maintain their choice. Uh, we do some of the things that you do in your bill. We do have a, a permanent physician reimbursement fix. We do have a, uh, a tax credit, reimbursable tax credit for low income Americans. Uh, but the big difference between the Republican bill and the Democratic proposal is that on the Republican side, we still believe in the marketplace. We don't have all the mandates. We don't force Americans into a government plan that we think is not very good for America. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll submit the rest of my statement for the record and look forward to the, these hearings. Thank you, Mr. Barton. And I am sincere in saying I want to work with you and share a brown bag lunch with you. <laughs> Thank you. Now you've got your bill. Um, I want to, um, and this bill is a draft. I want to recognize Mr. Dingell, the Chairman Emeritus of this Committee, uh, the champion of health care reform and the man who will be the first name on uh, the legislation uh, that will produce health care reform. Mr. Dingell. Mr. Chairman, first, thank you for holding this important hearing. And thank you for your remarkable leadership on moving forward towards the resolution of the health care problems we have in this country. I want you to know that I'm grateful and proud. And I'm particularly appreciative of the kind words you said about my dad. And on behalf of my dad and I, I want to thank you for your kind words and thank you for your friendship. I also want to do something of a personal character here, and that is to welcome Secretary Sibelius to the committee. Your father was a valuable member of this committee and sat in this room for a number of years, and we were always proud to have him here. And your father-in-law was a valuable member of the House, as you will recall, uh, and was a man who was much respected. So your coming is like coming home, and we hope you feel that way, Madam Secretary. Um, this week marks the beginning of a truly historic process, an opportunity to fulfill our moral and economic obligations to provide quality, affordable health care coverage for all Americans. The current system is not working. When my dad started on this years ago, it was a matter of humanitarian concern. Americans were dying for want of health care, and health care was not available to most Americans. Today, that still is true to one degree or another, but it is now an economic necessity, something which must be done to enable the United States to continue to compete in the world marketplace, and our industries are being killed by the lack of this kind of support in a fiercely competitive world economy. 47 million Americans are currently without health care, and upwards of 86 million will be without health care at some point during this year. More and more Americans are being forced to make decisions they never should be forced to make. Do they pay their monthly health insurance premium if they can get a health insurance policy? Or do they pay the utility bills, the mortgage, or do they buy food for the family? American business owners are facing a tough decision as to whether meet, to meet the monthly payroll or to pay health insurance contributions for their employees. And if you look at an American automobile, it's got $750 worth of steel in it and $1,600 worth of health care. Foreign competitors don't confront that problem. The federal budget can no longer sustain our current health care spending. If health care costs grow unabated, the costs to the country will be more than 20 percent of its gross domestic product on health by 2018. The discussion draft, and I stress the words discussion draft, we're considering is a uniquely American solution to this crisis. It's been a privilege for me to work with you, Mr. Chairman, with Chairman Rangel and Chairman Miller on putting this draft together. And I want to commend all of those, including the subcommittee chairman of the three committees, who have worked so hard to bring about unprecedented coordination that went into producing this single discussion draft for the three committees of jurisdiction. 
Now, I want to make some things clear. The discussion draft will not create a single payer system. It will not ration care. It will not attempt to destroy the private market system or the system of employer-sponsored health care many Americans enjoy today. And anybody who says otherwise simply hasn't read the bill or is not being truthful either with himself or anybody else. That being said, each of us in this room has our own vision of what ideal health care reform looks like. What, while the specifics may be different, we all share some common goals. First, we must pass legislation that reduces the cost of health care for families, businesses, and government. Second, we must pass legislation that makes quality, affordable health care available to all Americans. And we must pay for this legislation, and we must pass the legislation now. The choices we make over the coming months are going to be historically significant, and they will rank with the passage of Social Security and Medicare. If we are courageous and enact comprehensive health care reform, our product will meet the tests of history. And I would note, will rank, as I mentioned, with Medicare and with Social Security. Medicare was mentioned on the editorial page on Sunday of the New York Times is only short of the flag in its popularity. If we are not courageous, we will have failed this generation and generations to come, and the country will suffer for it. I am certain this year we will pass comprehensive health care reform that will build on the existing system, keep intact that which is working in our system, and give people the peace of mind that no matter what life changes they face, they will always have access to health insurance. The American people deserve nothing less. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Dingell. I want, now want to recognize Mr. Deal. Uh, Mr. Plone, as the chairman of the subcommittee, gave his opening statement yesterday. Mr. Deal uh, did not have that opportunity. And I want, uh, by unanimous consent, that all members have an opportunity to submit a written statement, opening statement for the record. Mr. Deal, for the last opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing, a series of panels today and tomorrow. Uh, I want to welcome all of the witnesses who are joining us, especially um, express my appreciation and welcome to uh, Dr. Todd Williamson, who is the president of the Georgia Medical Association. <clears throat> Certainly, as we consider this draft this week, hearing from these witnesses is important. Mr. Chairman, I think we have reached consensus that appropriate reforms are necessary, but we differ with respect to the right methods of reform, which will yield cost and higher quality savings and the decisions that uh, should be left to doctors and patients and not federal bureaucrats as they make choices about health care for our people. More government, in my opinion, is simply not the answer, but the draft before us seems to think that that is the answer. As far as the Republican views are concerned, <clears throat> we have seen thus far an attempt to approach health care reform uh, in a bipartisan fashion has resulted in what we consider to be a partisan proposal, which refuses to address the concerns of members on our side of the aisle. Last Friday, we received an 852-page reform draft. That's merely one legislative day before the committee began its hearings. Um, we are concerned about the cost. Congressional Budget Office has yet to weigh in on those costs. Uh, early analysis by Mr. Steve Parente, who testified before our Health Subcommittee yesterday, scores the legislation at a whopping $3.5 trillion over the next decade. We need to come up with real solutions to improve health care that American families can afford. The promise of the Obama administration and the leadership here on the Hill has been that if you have, you like what you have, then you can keep it. Uh, I believe that's simply a play on words because if this draft does what I think it will do, it will destroy that private health insurance market and will ultimately lead to what I consider a one-size-fits-all government uh, plan. If we focus on reforming the health care delivery system with the benefit of the American people in mind, then we should not focus our efforts on 
things that will destroy the private insurance market. I believe we should be encouraging physicians to enter into the field of medicine uh, as the demand for health care related services will continue to grow. But with the proposal before us today, which benchmarks public plan reimbursements to Medicare, that in itself continues to drive providers out of the system. And I believe we will fall short of the objective that all of us share of having a system that encourages doctors to enter, it promotes physician patient driven decisions, and allows everyone to gain access to health care coverage. Um, Mr. Chairman, we all agree that changes to our health care delivery system uh, have the potential to yield significant savings and improvements in the efficiency of delivery of care, but we must ensure that reforms that we put into place promote competition and transparency. As we move forward, I hope we will get that CBO score. I think it's important to the deliberations that lie before us. And Mr. Chairman, I want to reiterate again that those of us on our side of the aisle look forward to being able to work in a bipartisan fashion as we consider the potential for amendments that will obviously be suggested. Thanks again to our witness, uh, our secretary, and thanks to all the witnesses who will make up the panels that will follow. With that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Deal. Well, it was my pleasure to welcome Kathleen Sebelius to our committee for the first time as our nation's Secretary of Health and Human Services. And it's highly appropriate that uh, your first testimony is on the reforming of the nation's health care system. That's the president's, high president's highest priority and is a subject on which Secretary brings a unique breadth of experience. Most recently as a two-term governor of Kansas, service for eight years as Kansas State Insurance Commissioner, exceptionally valuable experience as we proceed with enacting and implementing health care reform and before that, eight years in the Kansas House of Representatives. Madam Secretary, I want to welcome you. We look forward to working with you and to your testimony today. Your uh, full uh, prepared statement will be in the record, and we'd like to recognize you uh, uh, to proceed as you see. But there's a, there's a button on the base of the mic, and be sure to pull it close enough to you. On would be good. Um, thank you, Chairman Waxman. Chairman Emeritus Dingle, Ranking Member Barton, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Deal. Thank you for this opportunity to join you for a critical conversation about health reform in America. As uh, the Chairman Emeritus has already recognized, my father did serve on this committee and he was here when Medicare was passed. So I feel privileged to be part of this historic conversation and delighted to have the chance to uh, work with you on this critical issue. No question that your release of a draft, discussion draft last week with your colleagues from Education and Labor and the Ways and Means Committees represents an historic moment in this debate. We not only appreciate the hard work you've already done, but grateful for all the work you're about to do as we work together to, at long last, enact reform. Health reform constitutes one of our most important domestic priorities, and we know the cost of doing nothing is simply too high. As the President has said, unless we fix what's broken in our current system, everyone's health care is in jeopardy. Reform is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Today in America, we have by far the most expensive health system in the world. We spend 50 percent more per person than the average developed country spending more on health care than housing or food. Health insurance premiums have doubled since 2000, and the high cost of care is crippling businesses who are struggling to provide care to their employees and stay competitive in this global world. Small businesses and their workers, the backbone of the American economy, are clearly suffering. As recently as 16 years ago, 61 percent of small businesses offered health care to their employees. Today, only 38 percent do. Last week, I was in Congressman Pallone's district with business owners in New Jersey who met with me about the sacrifices they have to make in their companies in order to provide health benefits to their employees. Even then, some of their employees can't afford the care they need. We spend more on health care than any other nation but aren't any healthier. Only three developed countries in the world have higher, uh, only three developed countries have higher infant mortality rates. 
Our nation ranks 24th in life expectancy among developed countries. More than one-third of our citizens are obese, and we know that 75 percent of our health costs are spent on chronic disease. Without reform, these problems only get worse. In 2008, we spent an estimated $2.4 trillion on health care. If we do nothing, by 2018, we'll spend $4.4 trillion. Today, we spend about 18 percent of our GDP on health costs. Doing nothing, those costs reach 34 percent of GDP by 2040, and 72 Americans will be uninsured. 72 million Americans will be uninsured. The CBO has recently estimated that by 2025, 25 percent of America's economic output will be tied up in the health system, limiting all our other investments and priorities. So there are many problems with our health system today, but there's also a reason for optimism. Across this country, there are lots of examples of hospitals and providers who are using new technology, cutting costs, and improving the quality of care. Two weeks ago, I was in Omaha, Nebraska, at Lakeside Hospital in a Legion Healthcare System, one of the nation's first fully digital hospitals, and saw firsthand how health information technology can help doctors and patients. Health care providers like the Kaiser System in California, the Mayo Clinic, Geisinger, Intermountain Healthcare have lowered costs, but more importantly, have improved outcomes for their patients. I've spoken to community health center providers from Ohio, Tennessee, and Pennsylvania who've helped outline how health information technologies help them save resources and provide better care. Our challenge is how to take the best practices and spread them across the entire country. I have every confidence we can meet this challenge and achieve our goals of reducing costs for families, businesses, and government, protecting people's choices of doctors, hospitals, and health plans, and at long last, assuring affordable, quality health care for all Americans. And we can do it without adding to the deficit. Now, the President is open to good ideas about how we finance health reform, but we're not open to deficit spending. Health reform will be paid for, and it will be deficit neutral over 10 years. The President has already introduced his proposals that provide about $950 billion over the next decade to finance health reform. Many of the resources come from wringing waste out of the current system and aggressively prosecuting fraud and abuse. We're currently paying for strategies which don't work or overpaying for medicines and equipment. It's time to make a better use of these dollars. We know that reform can reduce costs for families, businesses, and government, protect people's choice, and assure affordable health care. As we move forward, we'll be guided by simple principles, protect what works about health care, and fix what's broken. We've reviewed the key features of the Tri-Committee draft proposal, Mr. Chairman, from you and your House colleagues. And it's clear that you and your committee have embraced these principles. By creating a health exchange that will ensure numerous private insurance plan options, along with a public insurance option, the plan promotes choice and competition. By lowering health costs and providing premium credits, the plan makes health care affordable for all Americans. By investing in prevention and wellness initiatives, we help to prevent disease and illness and allow Americans to live longer, healthier lives. And with meaningful delivery system reforms, your policies offer lower cost yet higher quality health care. Under the plan you proposed, Americans will no longer have to worry about being denied care because of a pre-existing condition. They'll have easier access to tools that can help them prevent disease and stay healthy. Investments in primary care and underserved areas will improve all Americans' access to care. And the Medicaid reforms proposed in this bill have taken important steps to improve the critical safety net program, making it an income-based program and improving reimbursement for primary care. This discussion draft represents an historic step forward. And while we're still examining all the details, I agree with the President, who said this proposal represents a major step toward our goal of fixing what's broken about health care. We're building on what works. 
So, Mr. Chairman, I'm eager to work with this committee and your colleagues in the House and colleagues across the aisle in the Senate to deliver the reform we so desperately need. And I appreciate the opportunity to engage in this discussion and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Secretary Sebelius, for your testimony. I want to start off the questions uh, period myself. Uh, this um, issue of campaign of, uh, of the uh, health care reform was part of the campaign that President Obama waged in order to be elected president. And if there's any issue for which he has a clear mandate, it's to work on this very issue. Uh, and he has um, made this his uh, number one domestic priority. And I want to underscore in questioning you uh, some of the aspects of what he uh, hopes to accomplish and what he wants us to do in this effort. Uh, based on the President's approach, our draft, and it's just a draft, sets out a comprehensive approach uh, to reform. It addresses prevention and wellness, the health care workforce, quality of care, uh, broad-based shared responsibility, the um, in dealing with the costs and coverage through insurance reforms, a new exchange for people to go to get their insurance, affordability credits, improvements in Medicaid, substantial savings and improvements in Medicare. Is this what the administration is committed to? Uh, or should we approach this in a more compartmentalized, compartmentalized manner? Should we approach this in a, in a comprehensive way? Well, Mr. Chairman, as you said, this was one of the key um, priorities of uh, then Senator Obama and now President Obama. Um, and he believes strongly that um, we can't fix the economy without fixing health care. And so a comprehensive approach to um, a reform of the system is what is required. And I think it's what this legislation um, addresses in many of its components. Uh, there's no question that uh, you can't do just one thing at a time uh, in order to uh, have the system work for all Americans and fundamentally lower costs. Uh, there's no question that we can't continue on the cost curve that we're on right now. It is unsustainable uh, and will not serve anyone well. Those who have health insurance now um, are a month, a year, two years away from not being able to afford the coverage they have. Uh, those who don't have coverage uh, can't access some of the best technology and the best medical care in the world. So we need a comprehensive approach and we need to um, essentially shift a system toward wellness and prevention and away from the sickness system that we have. Mm -hmm. and so I think the elements that you have put forward in the discussion draft do just that. Uh, undertaking this kind of comprehensive reform is pretty complicated, and it's going to recall, uh, require an enormous amount of effort from members of Congress, some of whom will say, well, maybe we should delay, maybe we should go slower, maybe we should do it next year or the year after. Uh, what's the administration's view of the timetable for, for action and the need for action? Well, I think the President feels strongly that um, there is an enormous urgency about this issue, uh, which has directly to do with um, our economic well-being as a nation and our competitiveness in a global um, society, that our workers are less competitive with their colleagues across the world because of the increasing costs of health care borne by individual business owners, uh, small business owners, uh, the engine of our economy in states across this country, the fastest growing segment of our economy, are often less competitive to um, have high quality workers, talented workers, because they seek to uh, have health care provided along with their wages. And um, too many small employers can't any longer do that. Um, our focus on uh, prevention and wellness uh, needs to be dramatically increased so we not only have a healthier society and lower costs, but uh, have a society where our children are not facing the prospect which currently American children face, where we're seeing the first generation who may live shorter lives than their parents based on the rise in diabetes. So we have some challenges, Mr. Chairman, that mm -hmm. um, cause us to uh, enact legislation this year 
uh, to uh, urge uh, the action of both the House and the Senate on this important issue. It is difficult. It is complicated. Uh, if it were easy, as the President likes to say, it probably would have been done a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but Let me ask you one, one last question, yes. because my time is just uh, almost out. Um, we have businesses pay too much. We have government that's paying too much. We have small businesses that can't afford it at all for their employees. And of course, if you're without insurance and you have to go pay for your health care bill, it's impossible to let people go without the needed services. Do you think we need a shared responsibility uh, where every sector, individuals, employers, providers, and government move forward together and that everyone has to share in the cost? No particular sector says somebody else will pay for me, but we all have to be in there and uh, share in the costs, uh, and uh, collectively uh, we're all better off as a society. Well, I don't think there's any question that if you build on the current system, which is absolutely what the President wants to do and what the discussion draft proposes, then uh, there is a, a shared responsibility. Uh, over 99 percent of large employers provide health care coverage. A lot of small employers already do, but some don't. We have situations where some Americans opt in and some opt out of the insurance market. Uh, we need more personal responsibility, certainly in the life choices we make, um, which can help lower health costs. We need parents to get involved and inform. We need more preventive care. So there's certainly a sense where we are in this together. This is a fundamental issue. It's probably the most personal issue to every American, uh, what happens to their health care, their family's health care. And I think there's no question it needs to be comprehensive and it needs to involve everyone. Thank you very much. Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for, for being here. Um, you said in your opening statement that there would be no deficit financing as a result of uh, this health care reform package if it became law. Is that literally true? Um, Mr. Chairman, I was quoting the President. The President has said consistently that he will not sign a bill unless it's paid for. So we just want to establish on the record right off the bat that there will be no increase in the deficit as a result of a comprehensive health care package uh, if it does become law. That's just, I mean, plain language. That's what the President has stated as one of his top priorities. It will be paid for within the okay. period. Let me walk through just one part of your program. Um, it creates a new category of coverage under Medicaid uh, at 133 percent of poverty, which will be 100 percent paid for by the federal government. No state match for childless adults between the ages of 19 and 64. This one provision, if I understand it correctly, could add as many as 20 million Americans to the Medicaid program. Now, I don't know what the cost number is for coverage per person under Medicaid, so I just picked a number. And if, I, if my number's wrong, correct me. But I said $6,000 a year for insurance. That may be too high. But if you cover 20 million people at $6,000 per year, that's $120 billion right there per year. How do you pay for that? What are some of your pay-fors? Because in the bill, they're to be determined later. So give me an example of a pay-for that's $120 billion a year. Um, Congressman Barton, the President has uh, proposed about uh, $660 billion in savings from the current Medicare and Medicaid program. Uh, in addition, he has proposed uh, revenue enhancers of about well, That's over a 10-year period. Yes, sir, and I think your figure is... Per year. $120 billion per year. Well, I, I would start with the premise that, first of all, I, I don't know the numbers accurately, and um, I assume that your $20 million is within the ballpark. Um, I, I just can tell you that whatever the proposal that comes forward, the President has insisted that um, the bill will be paid for, the measures okay, you're, that are proposed will be paid you're, for. You're a former governor, I believe, isn't that correct? Yes, sir. I believe Two a term. 
Kansas. Is that Kansas is the state. Governor of yes. Kansas. Did, does, does Kansas have a, a balanced budget requirement for its state budget? Yes, sir. It does. Okay. When you were governor of Kansas, by law, you had to submit pay fors when you submitted a budget that spent money. Isn't that correct? Oh, we spent money within the revenues we had. Yes, ma'am. Now, again, my numbers may not be the number, but they are definitely in the ballpark. If I give the president the benefit of the doubt that there are out there $600 billion over 10 years in savings, $60 billion a year, this one expansion in Medicaid is still $60 billion a year short. You're the Secretary of Health and Human Services. I assume you have had some interaction with Chairman Waxman and Chairman Rangel, um, Chairman Miller, uh, in providing this draft bill. You have to have some idea of how you're going to pay for it. And again, I'm giving you the benefit. If the President says he can save $60 billion a year, I'll stipulate for purposes of this hearing, save 60. But I think you, you need to put 60 more billion in savings or in, in tax increases on the table. Well, Mr. Barton, you I'll had to do it when you're governor. That's true, sir. And this is a discussion draft. What I can assure you is uh, at the end of the day, the bill that passes will be paid for. We will work closely with the chairman here in the House and the uh, senators on the other side to come up with strategies to do just that. Well, shouldn't and we tell them up front? We don't have a, a CBO score yet for this bill, nor a score for the various proposals that are in this bill. But at least uh, you've, but got, you've got to put on the table where you're going to get the money. I understand. It's not a box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get. You just pull it out. Oh, there's $60 billion, whatever. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, but I, th I think we've established a basic point. I mean, it's a good thing if you're going to have no deficit financing. I commend the President for that. But it's a bad thing if you don't shoot straight with the American people where you're going to get the money. And nobody says that we're going to be able to save money to pay for these huge expansions, totally by savings, pay for these huge expansions. I just pointed out one part of the bill, and already uh, we're at least, in my numbers, numbers $60 billion per year short. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Mr. Dingell? Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, again, welcome. My questions will, will, I hope, evoke a yes or no answer. Uh, would it be appropriate to state that the Tri-Committee discussion draft was released last week aligns with the health reform principles the President has outlined earlier this year? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Um, now, Madam Secretary, there's been quite a dis bit of discussion about the inclusion of a public health insurance option uh, in the reform legislation. Does President Obama support the inclusion of a public health option uh, in the reform legislation? Yes, he does. Um, Madam Secretary, uh, hospitals and doctors are not required to participate in the public option. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, premiums and co-payments under that part of the proposal will cover the claims, will they not? I, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't. I said premiums and co-payments under the um, uh, public option will cover uh, the costs. That's my understanding. Uh, the public option must adhere to the same rules and regulations as all other plans. That's correct. Uh, the, the public option will be administered by a separate agency from the one that runs the exchange. That's the way the draft is written. Uh, the public option will offer the same minimum benefit design as all other plans in the exchange. Yes, a level playing field. Individuals and families will, permitted, will be permitted to apply subsidies towards both public and private plans in equal fashion. Yes, sir. And I apologize to you, Madam Secretary, but we've got a lot of, a lot of business to do here, and I hope I'm not being discourteous. Um, Madam Secretary, there has been justified concern over the consolidation of the health insurance market 
and the impact it has on health insurance claims. According to the American Medical Association, 94% of the insurance markets in the United States are now highly concentrated. This has decreased the amount of competition, and this is a major cause of spiraling health concerns. Yes or no? There is a monopoly in, in much of the country in the private insurance market, yes. Now, uh, th this is a serious concern then. How does the public plan address this concern? And this is not yes or no. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I think what the public option within the marketplace, within the new health exchange does, is use market principles competition and choice uh, to lower costs and provide consumers a choice of, of plans. So I think that the public option, absent a public option in many areas in the country, two-thirds of my state, for instance, in states around this country, there would be only one choice, which is not um, terribly effective in terms of holding costs down and certainly does not provide consumer choice uh, of a side-by-side -side plan, which is why states in State employee plans create public options standing side by side with private. Why many states have done that in the children's insurance program, uh, side by side options to give choice and provide some competition. Now, Madam Secretary, uh, rather, uh, Madam Secretary, as a former governor and a former insurance commissioner, you were able to speak to this question. Um, state insurance regulators are not able to regulate except as regard solvency of the insurance companies. Is that not correct? Um, sir, they can regulate solvency and also um, have some cost regulation, but frequently if there is no choice in the market, cost regulation is almost irrelevant. So uh, the competition being put into the market would be the one thing that would make these, would, would make this system work by having the public option there. Is that correct? Well, again, it's a, it's a marketplace strategy that competition is often much more effective than heavy-handed regulation. Now, Madam Secretary, uh, the, the, there's, there are questions about whether the tri-committee proposal uh, is a complex concept. It includes exchanges, a public health option, subsidies, Medicare and Medicaid improvements, responsibilities for individuals and employers. Uh, will the administration be able to fully implement and administer this proposal? Thank you, Mr. Dingell. Your, your, this, yes, your time has expired, but we do want to get the answer. What is the answer to that yes, question? Yes, sir. That's it? Just That's yes? why I ask it that way, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dingell. Um, uh, uh, gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Secretary, uh, our esteemed chairman made a a comment back during the markup of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which said, I think it is highly unlikely that you're going to find millionaires who would like to go on Medicaid. One of the concerns that this bill arises in the minds of many of us is whether or not we are treating low-income citizens as second-class citizens by automatically enrolling them in Medicaid. So my questions would be this. Why do you believe that a family making uh, $29,000 a year is not as able to make choices as a family making $30,000 a year? And why would it be better to simply automatically enroll them with no choice in Medicaid as opposed to giving them a subsidy to allow them to go into the private insurance market? Well, Congressman, um, some of those families, a limited number, are in um, jobs right now where they have employer-provided coverage, and they certainly would not uh, shift that coverage. But a large number, um, particularly of not families but single adults uh, who are at the 100 percent or below the poverty line, who are um, making often a very small amount of money, have no coverage at all. They are um, uninsured and uh, find themselves not in an ownership capacity. So the, I think the committees um, look at expanding Medicaid to 100 percent, 133 percent, I'm sorry, 
also follows the experience of, of many states that have already done that and found that the most effective strategy to expand coverage. Uh, it is a larger market. It often provides uh, a benefit package that is uh, cost effective and, frankly, is often far less expensive than the private options that exist, which is why states who have expanded coverage have chosen the Medicaid route instead of the private insurance route. As I understand the draft, it would propose that everyone under the age of 65 who is under the 133 percent of the federal poverty level would be enrolled in Medicaid. Uh, can you give us, first of all, a, how many people do you think that that encompasses and how many of those people currently have private health insurance? Um, sir, I, I don't want to cite numbers that off the top of my head, and I, I can easily return to you with those numbers. I apologize. I know that there are a, a fairly significant number of the so-called childless adults, uh, not parents, uh, typically because uh, a number of states, again, have taken steps for um, parents whose children are eligible for the CHIP program to actually provide expanded family coverage because they found that a very effective strategy when uh, enrolling children. But I think we're talking primarily about childless adults, often uh, below uh, that. Uh, I think they make less than $6,600 a year if you're at 133 percent of poverty. And that um, I can I can get back to you with those specific numbers. I would you would you please do that, yes. Madam Secretary? On page 73 of the bill, it provides for the automatic enrollment of individuals into the Medicaid program. I want to just ask you if the citizenship and identity verification requirements that are in the current law will still appertain into the automatic enrollment processes. And will you assure us that individuals who are illegally in our country or otherwise un ineligible for taxpayer-supported Medicaid will not be enrolled under this provision of this bill while you serve as our secretary? Uh, Mr. Deal, I can assure you that um, states now, uh, because of the uh, various federal rules requiring uh, verification of identity have those systems in place and um, really have, uh, I think, developed systems to verify identity not only of existing clientele but of enroll enrolling clientele, and that would certainly be in place as we move forward. So it would not be your intention or something that you would not allow to happen that the automatic enrollment process would not overlook or override those current verification requirements. That's correct. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Deal. Uh, Mr. Plone, Chairman of the Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Secretary, for um, being with us today. I wanted to uh, take my time just to ask about uh, Medicare and Medicaid. I, I think there's a certain amount of confusion because Obviously, in this discussion draft, and the President has stressed that we can save uh, money um, that would be used to pay for this plan uh, through uh, savings in Medicare and Medicaid. But at the, at the same time, there are major enhancements and improvements in both programs that are in the, in the discussion draft. And I think there's a certain amount of confusion about that. Overall, I think that um, if you view the combination of the uh, Medicare and, and, and Medicaid savings and the benefit enhancements, overall there's a, a, a market improvement in both Medicare and Medicaid. But I want to just uh, ask you questions about that. In other words, um, the draft proposes to begin filling in the donut hole in the Medicare prescription drug benefit to eliminate cost sharing on preventive services, to expand the eligibility and accessibility of Medicare subsidies for low-income enrollees. Um, uh, taking it as, as a whole, how do you view the combination of these Medicare saving proposals and the benefit enhancements as an improvement in the Medicare program? Well, Congressman, I think that um, there's no question right now um, there are areas where we are spending money that don't result in higher quality care or better results for patients. I think what this discussion draft uh, puts forward is a way, as you've suggested, to um, enhance the current program, to 
put dollars into areas where we think there will be much better results for patients. Um, hospital readmissions is a, is a category that's targeted for some focused attention. One out of every five patients leaving the hospital is readmitted uh, within uh, a series of weeks. That's not good for the patient, and it certainly uh, costs uh, a lot of money to the system. So coordinating post um, uh, release care, uh, actually providing incentives for follow-up care is, is a, a significant improvement that will not only lower costs for readmissions, but actually provide a lot better care for the patients. And those, I think, are the kinds of examples that uh, the discussion draft incorporates. Uh, better quality in the long run, following what we know are best practices that are in some parts of the system but not uh, appearing throughout the system. And frankly, uh, not continuing to overpay for services that have no uh, shown benefit or result. Did you want to talk about uh, filling the donut hole in this context? Because I know that's very much on the minds of the seniors, and we do propose to do that uh, in this uh, discussion draft. Well, I think that's a huge step forward. As you saw, um, the uh, chairman of AARP recently endorsed the strategy that um, is appearing in both the House and the Senate to um, fill the donut hole. It's a, it's a huge issue. I can tell you as, a, um, as an insurance commissioner, we used to face this situation with citizens who had no idea or really hadn't counted on the fact that their benefits would suddenly cease and their premiums would continue on. They hadn't saved appropriately for it, and often they were the I mean, the first people to hit the donut hole were the folks who had the highest cost of prescription drugs. And it was a not only a huge shock, but something that uh, forced a lot of people to stop buying their medications, to stop following the doctor's prescriptions, to end up in the hospital again without the care to keep them well. So this is a huge issue for seniors across this country who have benefited greatly uh, from lower cost drugs, but when they hit the when they hit the barrier, are, are really in worse shape than they were in the beginning because they're still paying premiums and they have no help. Now, what about Medicaid? I mean, there is a major expansion here in terms of uh, increased reimbursement rate, uh, covering uh, people in many states, people in many states that uh, that might be, uh, you know, that are below the 100 percent or the 133 percent with federal dollars. Would you want to comment on that? Because I just want to stress how even though we're making, we're, we're having savings from Medicare and Medicaid, we're really improving the program significantly. Well, there's, um, again, a, a lot of the conversation with providers, at least in, in my home state, was not really focused on Medicare, which is often a very popular program, but on Medicaid, uh, which uh, often under reimburses doctors and particularly primary care and family uh, providers. So enhanced uh, reimbursement for primary care I think is a huge step forward. And frankly, having a, um, a situation where if you are an adult or a family below 133 percent of poverty, wherever you go, you would have the same benefits if you move across the state line, if you um, need to travel with your family elsewhere, you would have similar benefits, the kind of portability that currently uh, is not available to a lot of people because they're, the benefits change state, state at a time. So that is a significant step forward. And uh, Mr. Pallone, while you're discussing um, Medicaid, I just wanted to share with the committee that at least my Staff has told me that the number, at least, that we have been given by uh, CBO for childless adults, uh, non-disabled childless adults who are in Medicaid, is really a $3,000 a person uh, average cost, not $6,000, as was suggested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pallone. Uh, I want to now recognize Mr. Uh, Mr. Whitfield. But I do want to announce to members there is a pending on the House floor a Republican motion to adjourn. We're going to continue the hearing, so those who want to respond to that vote uh, should do so and then come back. But we'll, we'll proceed. Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And Madam Secretary, we're pleased that you're with us here today. You know, uh, the question about the prescription drug benefit reminds me that 
Of course, before we pass the prescription drug benefit, most citizens on Medicare did not receive that benefit. And so they were paying for those medicines. And now we're trying to fill the donut holes so they don't have to pay for that either. So as politicians, you know, we like to expand coverage and give coverage and make it, uh, it, it sounds like that we don't want anyone to pay for anything. And yet, I know your father was involved with Medicare, according to your testimony, and I, I was looking at, at some of the debate about Medicare when it was adopted in 1965, and they're making some of the same arguments that you were making, uh, really, in your uh, testimony. And in 1965, they projected that but by 1990, the cost of Medicare would be $9 billion. As it turned out, it was almost $200 billion. And so we all like to, we know that our health care needs to be reformed. And, and then when you talk about it being paid for, it's going to be budget neutral. And then when they talk about, well, we're, we're, going, to, we're going to get a lot of money out of increasing efficiencies wringing waste out of the current system and being more aggressive to stop fraud. You know, it, it is so nebulous. <clears throat> and you're a very practical person. You've had experience as a governor. Do you honestly think that we can reform this system and actually save money and yet provide better quality health care? Congressman, I, I do, and I do um, so not based on some hypothetical situation, but based on visiting health systems throughout this country, in the middle of the country, in the coast, um, that do just that, who have higher quality outcomes time in and time out for their patients, who have used technology and uh, the provider protocol provided to and make sure that the um, results are better each and every time and who lower costs. I've seen it uh, in um, systems around the country, and I'm absolutely confident that we can do it uh, yeah. throughout the United States. Well, I'm glad you're confident, but, you know, I, I, I really am skeptical about it. <laughs> I hope you're right. But when we talk about being dev uh, budget neutral or dev uh, budget neutral, uh, and, that's good for the government, and of course the taxpayers pay for the government. But then this bill has a pay or play mandate on employers, uh, requiring them to provide a minimum benefit as established by the Health Benefits Advisory Council of 8 percent of wages paid. Uh, so there's a mandate there for small business people to pay 8 percent of wages to provide a benefit defined by a commission that's established in this bill. So for the, these small business people, I mean, if, they have, if someone has a wages, they're paying $500,000 a year, that's going to cost them $40,000. Now, are you concerned about the ability of small businesses to be able to continue to be competitive and provide jobs for the employees and, and pay this as well? Well, absolutely, I'm, I'm concerned about the competitiveness of, of our small business owners. And I think health care costs are one of the areas that um, is a huge challenge for every small business owner I talk to. They can't get great employees without offering health benefits. They're priced out of the market. So t uh, several things in this bill. First of all, the discussion draft makes it clear um, that there will be a specific small business exemption from the pay or play, uh, that it's my understanding that the um, committees are still working on the language. So that will occur. It's, it's in the Massachusetts. No, I know that there's an exemption, but there are going to be some people that will be hit by this. And the and that's okay. The creation, though, of the marketplace, I would suggest, actually gives them a, a uh, cost advantage that they uh, don't have now, uh, pooling yeah. larger risk, giving affordable okay, coverage. Let me ask just one other question because yeah. my time is about to expire. One of the criticisms we always hear about a one-payer, single-payer system and, and universal health coverage in other countries is that it rationalizes health care. Uh, that, and in America, our most expensive part of health care deals with end-of-life care. That's a big percentage of the way we spend money. Uh, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with rationalizing health care, but to really get big savings, do, do you think that we, we should be rationalizing health care in the U.S.? Many countries do. 
because that's the way they control their cost. I mean, do you think that we should be doing that? Absolutely not. I think that, um, again, the, the creation of a health exchange marketplace is uh, not a single payer system. And I think you'll hear today from some proponents who will strongly suggest that we should be looking at a single payer system, but that is not what the president, that's not what the chairman have put forward. They've put forward a, a plan that builds on the current system. Uh, rationing care, frankly, is something that happens each and every day on, under our current system, and it's often done by private insurers who get between a doctor and their patient and decide which practices can be met, which procedures can be paid for, what prescriptions. I think this is an opportunity really to make sure we have more patient-centered care, that we follow the protocols that work. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Markey? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, last year, um, Madam Secretary, um, I introduced legislation with then Congressman Rahm Emanuel uh, and Congressman Chris Smith from New Jersey called the Independence at Home Act. Uh, and the bill created a Medicare pilot project focused on improving the coordination of care and reducing costs for the most vulnerable Medicare beneficiaries, those with multiple severe chronic conditions such as Alzheimer's, ALS, Parkinson's, and other complex debilitating diseases uh, who also need help with two or more activities of daily living, such as dressing, feeding, et cetera. Uh, CBO has reported that 5 percent of Medicare beneficiaries account for 43 percent of overall Medicare spending, and CMS has noted that approximately 20 percent of Medicare beneficiaries uh, are with five or more chronic conditions account for 66 percent of program spending. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, how we can focus on those Medicare beneficiaries with multiple chronic diseases uh, and how perhaps a program like that focusing on home uh, and better coordination can help to reduce the costs? Well, we have um not only the demonstration that uh, you are uh, responsible for, but I think a number of um, projects underway looking at coordinating care, particularly for uh, the vulnerable, high-cost individuals. And uh, certainly having an opportunity to do that in a home base instead of a hospital-based service is not only better for the patient, but um, may provide some enhanced cost savings. So. We are eager to work with you, Mr. Markey, to uh, continue to uh, figure out better ways to not only coordinate care for uh, individuals who suffer from various chronic diseases and have uh, ongoing underlying conditions, but also to make it a more patient-centered system, which would lead us to, to more home care delivery. Okay. So in, in terms of home-based uh, programs for the beneficiary uh, population, do you see a, a shifting in that direction to make sure that, you know, that we try to reduce costs by trying to stabilize um, these uh, people at home? Well, as, as you know, there is a lot of effort underway, and um, a lot of it has been at the state basis, and I'm hoping that with health reform we can have a real collaborative partnership on rebalancing care, um, both uh, not only trying to prevent hospitalizations before they occur and provide care at home, but also the nursing home. A number of the patients that you're describing often end up in a nursing home setting because they, they don't have access to um, the wraparound services that they need. Uh, so uh, we would like to enhance that sort of um, home-based care, the, the care that really allows people to not only be more independent, but also at a lower cost than in a hospital or a nursing home. Our, our bill also would enable uh, uh, teams of primary care doctors, NPs, pharmacists, uh, and other care providers to form an organization to uh, contract with HHS to provide services to these chronically ill beneficiaries in their homes as part of a three-year uh, demonstrations. Uh, the organizations would be required to achieve savings of at least 5 percent compared to what these beneficiaries uh, would cost if they were served by uh, these coordinated care organizations. 
uh, if, uh, if they uh, don't, they must repay Medicare. If they achieve more than 5 percent, they can keep 80 percent of these savings with 20 percent of the savings returned to Medicare. Um, do, you, do you think that makes any sense to have cost savings sh uh, sharing that, uh, as a system that we could construct in the country? Well, I certainly um, support the notion of uh, beginning to pay for outcomes and uh, not for contact. Uh, too much of the Medicare system is driven right now by the number of times a provider mm -hmm. touches a patient, not necessarily what happens at the end of the day. So the system you describe, which not only um, would provide for a coordinated strategy, which is really what we need to occur throughout the country, but also save money, uh, it makes sense to provide those incentives to providers. Great. Thank you for your service. Sure. Thank you Thank for you. being here. Thank you, Mr. Markey. Uh, Ms. Christensen? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I guess this very, uh, there is some benefit, I guess, that, at least in this instance, to being a delegate <laughs> and not having to go to vote. Welcome, Madam Secretary. Thank it's you. good to see you. Last week, we had some very good conversations uh, on health disparities, but I note that at least in reading your testimony, because I had to step out both in the Senate and here, um, there was very little, if any, reference made to this very important issue that by itself results in close to 100,000 premature preventable deaths every year. So I hope that you'll work to ensure that your entire department is very sensitive to this critical issue and that the Office of Minority Health and in particular, the Office of the Sen National Center for Minority and Health Disparity Research will be elevated to an institute that's very critical to achieving the goals of eliminating health disparities. The bill um, has, uh, um, directs that a national prevention and wellness strategy initiative um, be in place, and you'll be responsible for identifying the key health and health care disparities. Could you uh, discuss briefly how you plan to fulfill this requirement and ensure that all areas of concern be identified, and how will the Agency for Health Care um, Quality and Research be involved since they've been doing uh, national dispar health disparity reports every for the last five years? Well, as I um, shared with you, Congresswoman, last week, um, we are I am, as a new secretary, uh, concerned that we um, make sure we do a lot more than publish the yearly reports, which right. uh, uh, have alarming statistics about health disparities, and uh, frankly, they are not getting any better. The gap is, in fact, widening. Health reform is a piece of the puzzle. I don't think there's any question having access for everyone to a higher quality, um, preventable care, a health home. Uh, is a step in the right direction, but um, I, I had a recent very productive meeting with uh, stakeholders uh, representing um, a lot of the groups who are often underserved uh, and assured them that we not only wanted a one-time meeting, but I want an ongoing strategy. I've met with our uh, team at um, our, our Center for Research and Quality about how it is that we are going to actually begin to close this gap because just providing reform and continuing the gap doesn't work. So we are aggressively uh, taking on not only the what has been already reported as effective strategies, but want the new team to be particularly focused on, on the issue of great concern to you and to me. I have another issue of great concern that really relates to territories. In your testimony, you said that reform is not a luxury, it's a necessity, and I definitely agree with it, that, and because it's a necessity, I think that certain issues like equitable coverage for all Americans should not really be held hostage to cost, and we discussed that a lot at the hearing yesterday. That said, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about the treatment of the U.S. territories in the current draft. We've been working for years to remove the Medicaid cap. Um, the bill, while it does provide um, additional funding to the territories, does not move us in that direction at all, and we're not eligible for subsidies. Um, so to me, uh, it makes it far less possible for men and women, American citizens, um, legal residents living in the territories to achieve the benefits that this bill will provide for the rest of Americans. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, Congressman, I, I would like to um, 
provide an opportunity for you to um, have that discussion with with me and our staff and and really would like to work with you as this process this is a work in progress it is. and it is a discussion draft and um, I I would just like to work with you to see how we can help enhance the the areas that you've identified as problematic thank you thank you Mr. chairman thank you very much Ms. Christensen uh, Mr. Stearns thank you Mr. chairman um, Madam Secretary, just I note that you earlier said that with the donut hole that the benefits stop and the payment continues. But of course, you understand that's for a small amount of time till they get above a certain amount, and then almost 100 percent of their benefits are paid for. I think you understand that. So it's not proper to say that their benefits stop because their benefits. Well, they stop for a substantial period of time, well, depending on how fast you buy drugs. Yeah, yeah. But anyway. Um, I have two questions, uh, Madam Secretary. Um, the President has indicated that if you, he said, quote, if you like your health care plan, you will be able to keep your health care plan, period. No one will take it away, take away, take it away from you, no matter what. I have here the uh, Lewin Group has done a study, it is a bipartisan study, which found that 120 million people, nearly 67 percent of non-Medicare Americans would lose their current coverage and be forced into a government-run insurance if a government plan was included. Uh, do you have any evidence that if a government plan is offered that 120 million people will be able to keep their current insurance? Well, Congressman, it is my understanding that um, that Lewin study has been updated and um, or at least disputed by a number of people that those numbers were um, significantly higher than um, folks. So believe. your answer is that you dispute the Lewin plan? I do. Okay. Uh, the next question is then, um, I have here a study by the HSI Network LLC, um, June 24, 2009. Uh, their study said that the bill we are discussing today would cost an astounding $3.5 trillion. Uh, do you dispute that fact? Sir, I am waiting to see what the CBO score says. I don't, I don't know the figures that you've just quoted. I don't know who the group is. Have you, have you seen this uh, report? No, I have not. Okay. All right. Um, now, the President has indicated that if any bill arrives from Congress that is not controlling cost, that's a bill he can't support. So the first question is, you don't agree with this report. You don't know about it. They said it's going to cost $3.5 trillion. Where, if it's not 3.5 or 3.2 or let's say 2.8, where are you going to get the money to pay for this bill? Again, Congressman, I think that once uh, the bill is scored and once the proposals are put forward, um, I'm eager to work with the committees in the House and the committees in the Senate to identify the cost savings. The President has proposed about a billion dollars worth of uh, revenue enhancements and cost savings that he feels are um, appropriate to spend on this. You, there you are mean, other ideas that are being proposed by members of the Senate and members of the House, and we are eager to well, work on Well, of course, on $1 billion bill. is not going to approach $3.5 trillion. But, sir, I, uh, so $1 billion is just a pittance compared to the 3.5 that this report shows is going to cost. Another question is that you really don't have any idea where you are going to get the money to pay for us. Do you have any evidence that shows if the government spends $3.5 trillion, that will save money. Let's not take the three and a half trillion. Let's just ask you where, if we spend all this money, where are you going to save it? Sir, I think, I think you start from the premise that we can't afford what we're doing. So not doing anything is not an option. Two trillion dollars plus a year is being spent and Americans are less healthy than they were years ago. So we have to change what currently is happening. And I think there is every evidence that the combination of health technology, driving quality and actually beginning to pay for prevention and wellness, uh, promoting primary care instead of disease care is a huge cost saver uh, over time. It is a effective to have Americans in healthier conditions. It is good for our businesses. It is good for our workforce. Well, I think so all it will save money. All the things you suggested, both sides would agree on. What the question is, is how do we do that? How do we reform the system so that there is universal access, uh, universal affordability? 
but at the same time, we don't have a government program that's going to cost three and a half trillion dollars. It's not paid for, with no statistics to show that it's going to save money. There could be an alternative suggestion, and I just suggest, uh, Madam Secretary, that you read the HSI Network LLC report that came out and go back with the latest uh, report from the Lewin Group. And uh, I think certainly before you come up here, you should have some answer how you're going to pay for this. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Stearns. Mr. Gett. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, one area that I've been working extensively with Chairman Waxman and also Senators Rockefeller and White House on is um, legislation that would strengthen the federal health care quality infrastructure in order to um, identify and track key health indicators, as well as to develop and implement new science across the states. What this bill does that we introduced would um, establish national priorities for health care quality, and it specifies that pediatric health care quality is one of the first. And, um, a lot of this legislation has now been incorporated in the discussion draft that we're talking about today. Um, but the draft bill also contains a provision that requires the directory, director of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality to work with you as secretary to develop quality measures for the delivery of health care services in the United States. Um, and I think this is an important requirement, but I'm worried about the implications for pediatric health care quality measures because even though the, the discussion draft requires the measures to be designed to assess the delivery of health care services to individuals regardless of age, the section is funded with Medicare dollars. And so um, under the previous administration, HHS determined that Medicare dollars could not be used for pediatric measures. I'm wondering if you can comment on this and what plans the administration has to address pediatric health care quality and um, what, what the view of the agency is going to be. Well, Congresswoman, I think that um, we are uh, convinced that Medicare can be um, a leader in uh, improving quality of care for all Americans. And, uh, certainly the development of quality standards, I think, is, is appropriately done under that umbrella. But uh, All Americans definitely includes children, and that is a, uh, is a huge priority of um, the countries moving forward. So there will be a, a co coordinated effort to make sure that the pediatric standards are very much developed in terms of quality outcomes. And do you think that can be done with the Medicare dollars or is that is that something we're going to have to explore as we move forward um, to, to the final legislation? In the discussions with our current leadership team at CMS, they are confident that we could fulfill the um, mandate that's in the bill right now to develop standards, including okay. pediatric standards. Okay. Because there's, I'm, I know you recognize the medical establishment, and of course our icon who was here, Marion Wright Edelman, yesterday. Children are not just many adults, so we've got to develop separate standards. That's right. Um, I wonder if you can talk for a minute about the administration's view on the um, Title VII health, health workforce dollars. That, that are included in the discussion draft? Well, I think as you look toward the future of um, a reformed health system, workforce issues are, are hugely important. And uh, I think the step was taken, a significant step in the um, Stimulus Act of beginning to fund the pipeline of critical health care workers, doctors, mental health providers, uh, nurse practitioners, additional nursing staff. And this discussion draft, I think, takes that uh, to the next chapter, which recognizes not only a shift in incentives for doctors to focus on primary care, but also has enhanced uh, workforce capacity, uh, again, with a whole um, series of initiatives that would 
uh, provide for more health care providers in more parts of the country. Thank you. Um, one last question. Uh, one of the provisions I was really pleased to have included in the discussion draft was the idea of auto enrollment at birth for children whose parents don't have insurance plans to put those babies in, and then 12-month continuous eligibility for children. I'm wondering if you can comment on the administration's position on that kind of auto enrollment. Well, I think it's been shown that um, the enrollment efforts um, vary from state to state often, and um, some still require a face-to-face um, -face visit. Others have uh, various complicated forms. So what's been proven as best practices, I think, is an easier uh, presumptive enrollment when kids show up at the hospital. Certainly auto enrollment at, at the time of birth would facilitate including children in the system and make sure they get a healthy start on life. So I think that's a, that's a big step forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gatt. Uh, Mr. Boyer. Thank you very much. Madam Secretary, what type of revenue enhancers have been discussed? Well, at this point, um, Congressman, the President has proposed a uh, return to the um, itemized deduction that uh, was present in the days of Ronald Reagan and feels that um, that would be an appropriate way to raise additional revenues. How much? About how much revenue would that raise? Uh, $340 billion is my recollection. Okay. Maybe. What are some other ideas that have been discussed? That's the revenue enhancer that the President has proposed. That's $340 billion. What, yes, what else? That's the revenue enhancer that the President has discussed. He's also proposed uh, over $660 billion worth of savings. So we're at about just under a trillion dollars. Okay. And we're still looking for another $2 trillion? Sir, I don't know. I, I have never had anybody discuss a $3 trillion bill, so I'm, I'm not really prepared to talk about a $3 trillion bill. I don't think there's a score on this bill. The, it's my the, uh, Going to the itemized deduction, could you talk about that just a little bit further? Who, who, would, who would that impact? It would impact um, basically the, the wealthiest Americans who uh, currently are paying a different uh, level of tax rate on their itemized deduction than, than middle income Americans. And okay. it would, again, and you're set, that the would rates. be set at what adjusted gross income level? Would that be set? Pardon me? At what adjusted gross income level would that be set? In other words, you're either going to deny additional itemized deductions. Is that what you're discussing? Just readjust the rate. They continue okay, so to the itemize deduction. They, they, uh, the highest income so Americans. If if, they, if, an, if an American family making eighty thousand no, dollars and sir, they, um, it's my what? understanding that it's over two hundred thousand uh, dollars. The last time I I saw the proposal, but that could have changed. What, what, at two hundred thousand. Would pay What happened? But then what happened to the president's promise and assurance to the American people that he would not increase taxes on anyone making? Below 250,000. Aren't um, you going to set 250? Otherwise, he breaks his promise to the American people. Sir, he's put forward this proposal and he's eager for Congress to talk about it. He thinks this is a, a way to raise so it's okay. revenue for. So it's okay for him to promise one thing to the American people and do another, just like what George Bush did. I won't increase taxes, and he did it anyway. So that's what, that's what your boss is proposing. Did you say to remind your boss, wait a minute, I'm, I'm your cabinet secretary? I'm, responsible for this? Do you realize you're about to break your promise to the American people if you do this? I did, did not say that to the President. What did you say to the President? <laughs> what, what did you advise the President? I told him I was eager to help him pass health reform and I was eager to help fulfill his commitment that it would be paid for within the period of time that the bill proposes over a decade. I think that's a fair promise to the American people that it won't increase the deficit. And I'm eager to work Medi with you, sir, to help. Medicaid get that plans, done. Medicaid, when you were governor and as a commissioner, Medicaid, states get a, get a grade with regard to the administration of Medicaid by the states. What was your grade when you were the commissioner <laughs> and governor with regard to the administration grade of the Medicaid whom? plan? Pardon? I don't. Uh, who's grading me? I, I don't know what you're talking about, but I mean, I guess the people of Kansas thought I got a pretty good grade because I got reelected as insurance commissioner and as governor. Okay. Well, you got a D. Maybe you thought that was good and that was acceptable. 
I am only concerned that if you think that a D is good and it's acceptable and you're glib about it here today, Madam Secretary. Gentlemen, I don't know what you're I, talking about. No, yield, who no, no, I, no, I'm not, I'm not going to yield. I, the, the, uh, the question I have here is, is if we're going to say unto our states that we're going to, the federal government will pick up an additional cost on Medicaid, how aren't we sending a signal unto the states um, that if the federal government is going to pick up additional costs, that they don't have to be as concerned and cost conscious. Is that, should I worry about that? Well, I would say that the bulk of the Medicaid beneficiaries will still have a very um, significant state share, and I don't know any governor in the country who is not concerned about the cost of Medicaid. One of the other things that does concern me, though, is with regard to doctors, say, you say that everyone will, will be guaranteed their choice of their doctor, yet when we're going to have some shifting that, in fact, will occur, and that, in fact, is recognized. So an individual who likes going to their doctor, now all of a sudden their plan may not be, their doctor may say, I'm not going to um, participate in the government option. Then they lose their choice of doctor. Would that be correct under this plan? Gentlemen, Only if time the individual has expired. chooses the public option. Say again? Only if that individual chooses the public option. Right. Then they lose their choice of doctor. Well, if that's the, doctor the individual's choice. Uh, doctors would not be mandated to be in the program. That's correct. And that's true of private insurance as well. That's true. Okay. Gentlemen's time has expired. Ms. Capps? Welcome, Madam Secretary, and thank you very much for being here today and for your testimony. I just want to make one brief comment about a population, about a group of people being discussed earlier in the conversation. Those uh, who will be covered, the childless adults who would be covered under Medicaid in this legislation um, with the cost amount, you're being asked about it. It's not as though these are, are folks that we're not paying for already and the kind of health care they receive currently, which is most often way expensive and inappropriate for their health needs, no prevention and so forth. I think that needs to be part of, of the discussion. But my questions to you um, have to do with the part of the country you come from, Kansas, as well as my part of my district, which is rural America, and some of the barriers to care there. But first I want um, to uh, take advantage of your expertise as insurance commissioner for a state uh, and uh, have you share with us briefly about some of the types of reforms that are needed to improve our current insurance market. Uh, some of the common abuses that you have seen um, and how you believe this bill will address uh, our, and that will be actually be a big cost savings as well. Well, thank you, Congresswoman. I think um, there's no question, uh, particularly in the individual market, but also often in the small business market, um, there are constantly uh, cherry-picking uh, activities by private insurers which do um, one of two things and often both simultaneously. Uh, costs can be uh, dramatically increased year after year, driving people out of the marketplace. But also, um, in the individual marketplace, the pre-existing condition barriers uh, often either make insurance impossible to obtain or uh, totally unaffordable to obtain. So uh, it is a huge barrier to Americans accessing quality health care. And are there provisions specifically in this legislation that uh, you believe will address this? Absolutely. Not only the, um, the kind of, uh, you have a couple of provisions. You have loss ratio provision, which would allow uh, a different uh, oversight to medical loss ratios, helping to eliminate some of the overhead costs. There is a provision that would exclude uh, insurers uh, any longer from um, denying people coverage based on pre-existing condition. And uh, there is a, a, a much more um, community-rated aspect to the health exchange, which would again uh, limit the kind of spikes in costs that small business owners often uh, see driving them out of the marketplace. Thank you. Now to my a part of my district. Um, I represent a county in California, San Luis Obispo, uh, which in which one company, WellPoint, has more way more than 50 percent of the market. It's the only private insurer. And the county also has a shortage of primary physicians because of a locality, a reimbursement issue that's far uh, different from what the cost of living in the, in the area really is. 
Um, the, the health, but this county also doesn't uh, um, quite qualify for a health professional shortage area. So there's these traps that, that many of the folks feel like they're existing in. Could you um, talk about your experience maybe that's similar, but also how this legislation could improve the choice of health plans for consumers in a county uh, such as the one I've described, and how also um, we need we really need to be able to attract new physicians to certain areas like the one I mentioned and many others in rural America, as well as some underserved areas in uh, in metropolitan areas as well. Um. There's no question, I think, that the uh, public option in the marketplace uh, achieves the very goals that you have just described, where consumers would have choice and there would also be cost competition. Uh, two principles, I think, that the administration very much believes in. Uh, in terms of the workforce issue, uh, again, the uh, initial investment in the um, Stimulus Act began the pathway to enhancing workforce, particularly in underserved areas with the doubling of the Commission Corps. But I think this bill takes an even a bigger step forward, recognizing that loan repayment is an effective strategy. Uh, uh, it attracts people to underserved areas. I would say the implementation of health IT will be a significant enhanced factor for providers who often don't want to be isolated, but with health IT can be in frequent consultation with specialists and with um, colleagues in various parts of the country and various parts of the state so they are not uh, in isolated practices. So there are a number of features uh, that are not only in this discussion draft but in the bills that you've previously passed that I think really help to address the workforce issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Capps. Um, we, we now go to uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Madam Secretary, I'm over here in the broom closet behind the kids' oh. table, <laughs> where they keep me on this committee. Um, <clears throat> during your, and, and welcome to our committee this morning, during your uh, confirmation hearing before the Senate, uh, I believe the statement was made that you said, if confirmed, I will not only be an eager partner to work with Congress, but that I understand by partisanship. Is that a, a reasonable facsimile of the, of the testimony that day? Um, yes, sir. Now, I know that uh, the Senate Health Committee, the ranking member, has sent a, a letter June 16th in a follow-up to a request submitted June 10th, uh, sent by the ranking member of the Senate Health Committee, where they note that despite providing technical assistance to the majority regarding the Affordable Health Choices Act, that same courtesy had not been avail made available to the minority of the committee. Well, when can uh, we uh, tell the Senate to expect that you are going to help them with the, the Republicans of the Senate Health Committee the same technical assistance that you have provided to the majority on the, on the Senate side? Um, sir, it is my understanding that our staff and um, Nancy Ann DeParle, who is the White House uh, head of the Health Reform Office, have been um, in the House and in the Senate on a daily basis providing information and expertise, modeling, um, a whole variety of situations. I am not sure specifically what was requested that has not been provided, but I know that they have been available, accessible, and very present uh, day in and day out. Well, Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent to make the, the Senate letter part of the record. And then just to follow up, for our committee here on, on the House side, will that same technical expertise be made available to the minority uh, in, in the House? Sir, as, as much as we can provide um, background information and assistance, we stand ready to do that. Well, and we stand ready to access that. Let me, uh, let me ask you a question in your prepared testimony this morning. Um, there is a discussion about the President has introduced proposals that will provide nearly $950 billion over 10 years to finance reform. Uh, that is following the statement the President is open to good ideas, how we finance will not add to the deficit. Now, in a, in a world in which 96 percent of people have health coverage, um, 
am I correct in presuming that the money that is afforded for disproportionate share hospitals and upper payment limits, that, that those funds will no longer be necessary for our safety net hospitals? And is that where, where a portion of this $950 billion is coming from? Uh, there is a proposal in the um, uh as part of the package that at least a reduction in the DISH payments uh, be anticipated as health reform is fully implemented. I don't think anybody anticipates a world in which there would be no uh, additional help and assistance to those hospitals that are providing the bulk of care to people who are um, uninsured, but hopefully the uninsured will go down. There are additional, I think, features about that. Uh, cultural competency, uh, a range of additional services that have to be provided. And just to point out, in my home state of Texas, a significant number of the uninsured are in the country without benefit of a social security number. And until we resolve that issue, the need for safety net hospitals is, is going to continue uh, because I suspect that uh, there will be some people who are left out of the 96 percent who actually have health coverage. Now, uh, the, uh, and I was glad to hear you reemphasize this morning that the president uh, wanted to protect what work what works and fix what's broken. I'm glad you went to Omaha. Uh, I went to Omaha earlier this year. In fact, Allegiant came here last year and, and did a did an event with us. They are one of the forward uh, looking institutions in this country, and and there are many others. But testimony at this committee yesterday, really without the ability to have the health savings account and the health reimbursement account to be able to provide the correct incentives for their patients to, to access the preventive care that we all want people to, to feel is important. Without those tools, it would be very, very difficult for them to operate the kind of, the kind of uh, facility that they have today. I'm sorry, without the health savings? Without the health savings accounts and the money made available through health reimbursement accounts. And I guess what I'm getting at is, it, it, could we get this morning a definitive answer? From my read of this bill, it's before us. It appears that health savings accounts are not going to count as qualified coverage. Is that correct from your reading of the bill? Um, sir, I can't. I, I will go back and, and make absolutely sure. I don't. I know that there is no intent to eliminate health savings account. How they are actually defined, um, I need to, to recheck, but health savings accounts would still be available to Americans as they are today. I'm, I'm not Thanks. certain that that's correct under the language of the bill, and, and I think okay. I will. the President could do a, a, a good service by instructing us to, to help people avoid a penalty for not having credible coverage or qualified coverage if they choose to get their insurance through a health savings account and again that have the You're plus a health savings account absent another insurance policy. That's correct. Uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, yield to me. Your time has expired, but I do want to clarify. No, my time is just starting. It hasn't gone green yet. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want to dispute with you on that, but uh, I'll be happy to yield. But to I want to clarify that I do believe that health savings accounts are not adversely affected in the draft bill. That would be a ways and tax issue, but I don't think that's the intention. Well, Mr. And we'll get a clarification because you raise uh, an important question. Just briefly reclaiming my time, if you look at the rate of increase of all of the different products out there, high, high option PPO, Medicare, Medicaid, all increase at a rate of 7.5% a year. We heard testimony from the uh, uh, chief medical officer at Allegiant yesterday that their rate of increase was about 5 percent a year. So it, it seems to me that if we want to figure out what works, we would look at those types of programs, give people an incentive to, to select healthy behaviors, make it important to them, and I think we will find that people by and large will do the right thing. It's thank not you, for Mr. everyone. Mr. Burgess, thank you very much. Uh, there are other members are waiting and the secretary is going to have to leave, so I do want Yield to back. get some of the others. Uh, Ms. Matsui. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, welcome, uh, Madam Secretary. We're so happy to see you here. Thank you. I was pleased to see the components of uh, legislation that I authored, the Public Health Workforce Imp Investment Act, were incorporated into the draft bill before us today. The creation of a Public Health Workforce Corps is a major step forward and will revolutionary revolutionize health, uh, public health forever. It's also, as you know, a necessary step because we're staring a public health workforce crisis directly in the face. 
In order to satisfy our future public health needs, we'll need to train three times as many public health workers as we are today. Otherwise, the rates of obesity, diabetes, and other chronic diseases will likely rise. And we need to reinvest in this crucial part of our public health infrastructure so that we can take community-based actions to prevent long-term public health crisis. Secretary Sebelius, you are head of what I figure is the largest public health agency in the world. You probably know as well as anyone that the public health workforce is rapidly aging. By 2012, half, half of the public health workforce in some states will be ready to retire. In my opinion, our public health system did a good job of managing the recent H1N1 flu outbreak, but this incident has showed us how critical it is to not let our public health workforce deteriorate any further, and I'm pleased that the, uh, my piece of it was incorporated into the draft bill. Madam Secretary, I want my colleagues to understand how critical the public health workforce is. Will you please outline for the benefit of this committee how your job is dependent on having a robust public health workforce backing you up? Well, Congresswoman, for, first of all, thank you for your leadership in this area and your um, longstanding expertise and insistence that the public health infrastructure has to be part of this dialogue and discussion. And I think you appropriately identified the, the recent situation still with us, with the H1N1 virus and the anticipation that um, we will need additional activity uh, points to the uh, need for a robust infrastructure. And as you correctly point out, um, in many parts of the country, it's not robust enough now, and we're facing a looming retirement of um, lots of uh, individuals. So um, having not only the pipeline, uh, the you know, Commission Corps has doubled. Uh, there are efforts to enhance, uh, again, through the Recovery Act, um, the community health center aspect of, of the public health um, backbone in this country, and I think that's an important step forward. Uh, no question that we need not only further attention to workforce issues, but also uh, further attention to quality standards in uh, public health agencies throughout the country. Uh, and I can assure you that our, our new leadership of uh, Dr. Tom Frieden at um, the Centers for Disease Control uh, is a huge believer that um, the public health infrastructure uh, needs to be enhanced and needs to be improved and needs to be um, uh, focused on. And he is coming to this job uh, as a, a new CDC leader with that agenda at, at the forefront of his priorities, and it's one that I share. Well, why are we facing such a crisis in public health workforce today? I know part of it is that we need more graduates from public health programs, but I think the other part of it is that we may not have the right incentives for the graduates we do have to enter public service. Well, I think, I think the whole um, incentive uh, system in health care is one that um, is on the table for review as we look at the reform agenda, how we not only attract uh, more students to medicine in the first place, but how we attract more of those students to the appropriate uh, shortages. But do you think that the scholarship and loan repayment provisions in the draft bill will help incent public health graduates to these public workforce? I don't think there's any question that those strategies have been proven to be enormously effective. Students, unfortunately, today are emerging with um, uh, mountains of debt, and often uh, public health officials aren't paid as handsomely as, as some in the private sector. So helping to retire that debt, helping to um, erase that debt is an enormous step to allowing students to actually make choices that they might find more rewarding, but currently find financially um, on, out of reach. Okay. I thank you very much. You'll back my balance of time. Thank you. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingry. Madam Secretary, thank you for being with us this morning. You, we were asked a little bit earlier about your grade as governor. I would say that your grade so far this morning has been pretty good. Uh, so hopefully you won't mind a couple of uh, tough questions from me. Uh, 
in quoting in your testimony, uh, without reform, according to the Medicare actuaries, we'll spend about $4.4 trillion on health care in 2018, and by 2040, health care costs will reach 34 percent of GDP. Madam Secretary, these numbers are indeed staggering, and I share your concerns. However, uh, I have another concern. I need to be reassured that uh, you share that. The Medicare trustees report that the Medicare program will become insolvent by 2016. Roughly 45 percent of Americans currently receive their health care from a government payer, and yet your testimony focuses almost exclusively on the private sector, uh, private sector health insurance companies and ways in which they should be reformed. Since uh, his inauguration, President Obama has spoken of the need for entitlement reform. Certainly President Bush did the same. So given that 45 percent of all Americans get their health care from a government program and the fact that your department oversees the largest government program tasked with insurance that quality health care for our seniors is available both today and the future, shouldn't entitlement reform be an integral part of this legislation? Yes, sir. Um, I think it definitely should, and that's why I, I am I'm confident that not only uh, a number of the proposals to enhance quality for seniors are important, and we've talked a bit about closing the donut hole, which is a huge issue, but also the savings that are proposed by the President uh, will enhance the lifetime of the Medicare program that you've just cited, and also lower premium rates, Part B premium rates, for the seniors who are paying them. So it has a win-win-win situation. It helps to uh, pay for a longer life, frankly, of the program that's so uh, important to Well, Madam Secretary, re reclaiming my time, since it's so limited, I, I would have to tell you that I think that's nibbling around the edges when you, uh, the latest Medicare trustee report says that by 2083, we'll have $37.8 trillion worth of unfunded liability in the Medicare program. You state that uh, since 2000, the year 2000, private health insurance premiums have almost doubled, growing three times faster than wages. Madam Secretary, do you know what percentage Medicare Part B premiums have increased since 2000? You just referenced that just a second ago. Let, let, let me just tell you if, you, if you don't have it on the tip of your tongue, they have more than doubled since 2000, 111 percent. That's how much Medicare Part B premiums have gone up since 2000. So I would suggest to you that the parity between Medicare Part B premium increases and insurance premium, private insurance premium increases, suggests that high health care costs are rampant and they're integrated. So it's not just private, but it's uh, public as well. So we need both private insurance reform and Medicare reform. Simply turning the system over to the government, I think, will not solve this problem. Uh, and without addressing Medicare reform, we'll leave many seniors without quality health care coverage. Uh, let me uh, just real quickly, if I might, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary, uh, you quote your testimony in your testimony that reform will guarantee choice of doctors and health plans. No American should be forced to give up the doctor they trust or the plan they like. If you like your current health care, indeed you can keep it. Do I take it from your testimony that you mean all Americans will be able to keep the health plan that they like, including the 11 million seniors who get their Medicare from Medicare Advantage? Well, sir, I certainly hope so. Um, the proposal to stop overpaying for Medicare Advantage um, is one that is included in the President's cost savings. Um, after years of uh, examination, there are no enhanced benefits, and they're being paid at about 14 percent higher a rate than other programs. As you know, the, the um, Center for, Medicaid, for Medicare Services has proposed that uh, there be fewer plans this year uh, because of the proliferation of plans and the fact that um, consumers often didn't choose them. We got a bunch of plans that have fewer than 100 people uh, choosing them, and that is not a very cost-effective way to run a system. So there will be a consolidation, but ideally the doctors in the networks will remain available. The uh, gentleman's time is expired. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your patience. Madam Secretary, I thank you for your response. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have a um, gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary, for joining us today. And as a uh, native Ohioan, uh, I want to welcome you uh, as well. Uh, there are uh, so many different areas uh, worthy of discussion uh, that it's difficult for me to, to define one uh, uh, to uh, ask you about. But uh, given the rural nature of my district and Ohio generally, uh, and given the special challenges that those in rural America face when accessing health care uh, and the barriers that, that we've got, uh, and given that one of those challenges ha happens to be uh, uh, attracting and retaining uh, sufficient uh, workforce, specifically primary care uh, doctors, uh, specialists, some uh, adolescent specialists in particular, uh, what, uh, in your assessment, does uh, the President's initiatives uh, and what does this bill uh, do with respect to attracting and retaining uh, quality workforce in rural areas uh, where that's historically been a problem? Well, Congressman, I um, share your concerns about rural access. Uh, certainly it's something I worked on as um, governor of a state like Kansas where um, two-thirds of our um, population is in very rural areas. Um, I, I think there's no question that the uh, incentives for um, enhanced workforce is a step in the right direction. I think that telemedicine, uh, which is uh, on the horizon and certainly an important component of health IT, is a huge step forward. A lot of providers in Kansas and I'm sure Ohio um, are concerned about their isolation and want to make sure they, they are able to access colleagues and access consultation. Uh, and I think the steps that are included in this legislation that um, pay for student loans and encourage um, additional incentives for primary care and family care docs also enhance the, the workforce in, in rural as well as urban areas. And uh, I just have a couple more minutes. I want to just make a, a comment as a follow-up. You mentioned telemedicine, and I, I guess I want to take this opportunity to explain to you as a member of the administration how, just how important it is to access uh, uh, broadband and high-speed Internet in those areas that can benefit from telemedicine, that, that uh, bridging that digital divide uh, is so very important in so many areas, including uh, uh, accessing quality health care. Uh, one other uh, area I wanted to bring up has to do with uh, some of the geographic disparities uh, pertaining to chronic disease. And coming from Appalachia, uh, one of the things we see, for example, is a higher uh, rate than, than average or normal in uh, diabetes incidence. Um, how do we uh, make wellness and prevention programs address these specific regional disparities uh, when it comes to uh, chronic diseases like diabetes? Well, there is a, um, a new uh, grant that uh, we just made available, which actually focuses specifically on areas with the highest rates of diabetes and chronic disease in terms of um, providing incentives and providing additional resources to um, not only coordinate care, but do much more effective uh, monitoring of um, conditions. I think that uh, there's no question that preventive care at a much earlier stage helps, but also what helps uh, to prevent hospitalizations, amputations, a variety of things, is to uh, make sure that those suffering from diabetes uh, actually are staying on an appropriate regime and that monitoring is, is what the grant is designed to do. I think we've, we're trying to follow some best practices which have proven to be very effective and my guess is that your area is likely to be unfortunately rising high on the list of an area that's uh, likely to be one of the, I think there are 133 communities that will have additional resources to focus just on this effort. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And I yield back my time. Thank you. Mr. Walden. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, thanks for being here today and, and the work that you're doing. I have some questions. I, like many of my colleagues, am just starting to look through the uh, discussion draft that's out. 
Um, and I know that you've undoubtedly played a, a role in, in working with some members of the committee on this. So if, uh, if you can help me with some of these things. Is it true that under the bill, an employer could be subject to 8 percent tax even if they offer a worker an employer-sponsored health care policy? Um, yes, I think that is accurate that um, there are some ways, if it isn't uh, determined to be credible coverage, um, that it, you could have the pay or play provision. And, and I think it's all, if I'm reading it correctly, isn't it also true that if the employee decided to go with the, uh, with, through their, their own plan, the employer could still end up having to pay the, if they went through the exchange, I guess it is? Tell me how that process works. If they, because if, an employee could refuse the plan from the employer, correct? Um, I, I must confess. Uh, the people Congress behind you are, I, are are shaking their head yes. So, <laughs> I, I think. Um, and, um, I I am not familiar with that specific provision. I'd be glad to get back if you want to give me the, the questions. I will immediately respond. I'm just not. Um, well, my understanding is that that an employer could offer. Uh, an employee, uh, employer sponsored health coverage, then the worker could turn it down and enroll in the exchange plan. The employer would still be liable for the 8 percent tax, even though providing the employer sponsored care could have been cheaper, is what I understand. So if you could take a look at that. We'll definitely take a look at is, that. Thank and, you. and is it true that in order for an employer to avoid paying the 8 percent tax, he, the employer has to offer a plan that the new commissioner deems to be a qualified health benefit plan? That is correct. And can an employer require an employee to accept the employer-provided health care coverage? Can you require an employee to accept it? Um, I, I don't know, again, how the provisions are drafted. I'm not aware of any mandatory um, in a private insurance market how you mandate that anyone accept a plan. But I, yeah. I haven't read the Okay. Outline of the bill. Sorry. Do you know if state, if, if these provisions uh, are, are states and federal government considered employees under this draft? States and federal government are, are considered Mr. employers. Mr. Walden, under can I just? Employers? You know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to stop you, but I mean, it's the the draft, the discussion draft is you know put together by the members, and I don't know that she can necessarily be the person to comment on what's in it. Uh, but I mean, if you want to continue, well, but I well, I, yeah, I just, we are on my time here. I'm going to give you some extra time, but I just want you to understand that we didn't ask her here to comment on the provisions of the draft per se. Oh, I thought earlier she was indicating support of, of the draft that the administration supports this draft or the concepts in this draft. Is that not true? Sir, I said it, we support the principles that the, that prompted the draft. I'm sorry, I am not. The draft came out on Friday, and I ha okay. I didn't write the draft, and I'm not. Intimately familiar, but I'd be happy to answer questions if you if you have questions okay. for me. I'd be. I mean, I don't so, want to so stop you, but I'm claiming my to time. Um, if I could, so you haven't you haven't read this draft either, then. I have read it. I can't. I don't have it memorized. Yeah. Well, no, I appreciate that. I, I you're ahead of me. I haven't read it fully, um, but I also know the way this committee has been operating of late. It moves rather rapidly, so I doubt we'll have a chance to ask you these questions uh, before we suddenly have to vote on this. Um, so it, 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 that's why I'm, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I know that others in the committee have asked you a pretty uh, specific set of yes and no questions. And again, I'm just trying to be honest with you. If I don't know the answer, I'd be happy to get it for you. I just. Well, let me, let me go to another point then. And that was a comment you made about um, Medicare and Part D. And, and this, I don't think, is necessarily in the draft. Do you know uh, what the Medicare Part B premium was in, in 2000. I wouldn't, I'm not going to play a gotcha game here. It was about $45.50. Uh, in 2008, it was $96.40. Uh, Medicare Part D for 2009 was $29, which was 30 percent lower than the original projected when we passed Medicare Part D in, in 2003. I understand you issued a report yesterday showing that employer sponsored premiums. Um, for health care doubled between, I think it's 2000 and 2008 for health insurance. Medicare Part B premiums have more than doubled, 110 percent increase in the same time span. And I think what a lot of people are asking me about when I was home in Rufus and Arlington and Fossil and out in my district, they're saying, if Medicare is going broke by 2017, 
and we're going to just expand and add all these people into a government-run system. We can't get access to providers now when the government runs the system, which, as you know, is a big issue in rural areas, getting access to a doctor if you're in Medicare. They're saying, how does this new government-run plan going to hold down costs? And how is it going to expand? How are we going to pay for this is the underlying issue here. And the estimates, they're just saying, you know, you talked about health insurance could cost us, uh, you know, or, or health coverage $4 trillion or something. This plan alone, I think, some estimates are that. So people at home are really struggling with, with the dollar amounts here. Well, Congressman, the, um, the plan, uh, again, that uh, the, at least the payment side that the administration has put forward uh, not only saves dollars in Medicare, but helps to extend the life expectancy of, of the Medicare um, trust fund, an important feature, and lower um, overall costs in the Part B premium for the beneficiaries who are currently paying, as you say, higher costs. I am a believer that Medicare has to get at the front of the lower cost, higher quality care for the beneficiaries of the system, and that we can be uh, not only innovative, but help to drive the best practices which exist now in various parts of the country to scale. Uh, right. So that's really one of the intents of the new program moving forward. I, I appreciate that, and I'll close with this. that I, I spent five years on a small community hospital board, and, and it seemed like Medicare gave us the most headaches, uh, not the least reimbursement, but second to least reimbursement. And there was an enormous cost shift going on when the federal government was involved. And now you got this access issue trying to get to physicians that will even take Medicare patients. And so I don't want to see us create a, a, a government-run system that mirrors one that, that isn't sustainable right now. And so I, and, and, and you know as well as I do, some of the goofy rules in Medicare that drive seniors to the hospital to get, you know, an injection when they should be able to get it at home. Telemedicine is a great thing, but if you are a, a provider and you are on the other end of the telemedicine, you don't get reimbursed for that consultation under Medicare. So there is a disincentive to doctors to participate. There are some things, irrespective of this debate, we could do to really improve Medicare, I think. Mr. Chairman, thanks for your generosity on the I time. Sure. I might know I've run. Sure. Now, let me just uh, remind members, um, I, we mentioned this earlier, um, but I want you to know that the Secretary um, has to leave at 12. Um, now, of course, we are going to have uh, written questions uh, for many members, including those who have already spoken and, and those who have not, uh, to follow up and she will get back to us. Um, Mr. Chairman. I, yes. Uh, could we ask uh, the Secretary if she could have those answers back by July the 6th? I think that would give a, about a week. Uh, um, normally, we we s submit the questions within 10 days. So that would, uh, I'm trying to think, figure this out here. If, if you all agree to get, send her the questions within 10 days, then I think she has to have at least, I don't know, July 6th is kind of early, isn't it? Mis Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, uh, just as a form of um, suggestion to this, maybe with the remaining time, those of us that do have specific questions, if we can just address our question to her and then not get a response, but get the response. And well, this I, is what I'm going to do. I just, she has about 10 minutes left or five minutes left. I have Mr. Engel is next, and then I have you, uh, uh, the gentlewoman from Tennessee. I think that's all we're going to be able to do. I'm not going to put a timetable on when you get back to us with the written responses I, uh, at this point. I mean, Mr. I, Mr. I, 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 and I don't want to run out of time. I'd like to be on that list, too, for questions. All right, let me explain again. Anyone can submit written questions. Normally the committee asks members to well, submit I, them. Well, I think on something this important, within I'm just 10 really days. offended that we don't have the opportunity to ask questions well, to her. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I just don't want to waste I, the time that we have remaining. You know, so when other gonna, directors and secretaries came in, when we were the majority, uh, you raised holy hell if they didn't stay here for every question. Well, there's not much I can do about that now. I'm going to ask Mr. <laughs> Engel to, uh, uh, to uh, your, uh, your next. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Madam Secretary, first of all, you know, welcome. Uh, I heard your opening statement, and um, I was delighted when President Obama selected you, and I, I think you are doing and will continue to do a great job, so welcome. Um, I, I want to call two things to your attention, which are two health 
uh, priorities of mine. Um, firstly, I was pleased to see that my legislation, the Early Treatment for HIV Act, uh, which I introduced with Speaker Pelosi, was included in the House Tri Health Reform Draft. We call the bill ETHA. And ETHA, uh, in conjunction with the House's proposal to cover all low income people under the Medicaid program to up to 133 percent of the federal poverty level, is a significant step towards reducing the number of uninsured people with HIV uh, in our country. Um, as you know, ETHA, this bill, um, addresses a cruel irony in the current Medicaid system. Under current Medicaid rules, people must become disabled by AIDS before they can receive access to Medicaid. Uh, 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 and this is uh, care that could have prevented them from becoming so in the first place. In other words, Medicaid won't help you unless you have full-blown AIDS. And as you know, if someone tests positive to HIV, it could be a number of years before they have full-blown AIDS. So it makes much more sense to help those people once they test positive to try to stave off the full-blown AIDS. And it's an irony that you couldn't do it. So what ETHA does um, it gives states the option to provide people living with HIV access to Medicaid before they become disabled by AIDS. Um, President Obama repeatedly in his um, quest for president uh, said that he supports it. When he was in the Senate, he co-sponsored the bill. And, and I just want to ask you if I can continue to count on the administration to continue to support ETHA, and will you work with the states to take up this option if it's included in the final reform package? Yes. Thank you. That's the answer I was looking for. And um, secondly, uh, the second priority is um, uh, home infusion. And, and um, we know that some delivery system uh, changes need to be part of our health reform package. And this legislation, the second piece, um, addresses um, an anomaly in the Medicare care program that forces patients into hospitals and nursing homes to receive their multi-week infusion therapy when the same care could be delivered safely in the patient's home or where the patient prefers to be uh, with outstanding results, lower costs, and virtually no risk of health care uh, acquired infections. So I believe that it makes no sense that Medicare pays for all costs associated with infusion therapy when it is provided in far more costly hospital and nursing home settings, but will not pay for the cost of home infusion. Um, for decades, private health insurance has covered home infusion therapy. It's used extensively by Medicare Advantage plans. Medicaid programs cover it, but Medicare fee-for-service stands alone in the failure to cover the services, uh, equipment, and supplies needed for home infusion therapy. So, my bill, which is the Medicare Home Infusion Therapy Coverage Act, I've introduced with 92 members of Congress. I've introduced it with my Republican colleague, Tim Murphy, and 20 members of the Energy and Commerce Committee are sponsors. So I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, can I have your commitment that your staff will work with me and Chairman Waxman's staff on meaningful legislation to close the Medicare Home Infusion Benefit Gap? We will certainly um, look forward to working with you and, and seeing what can be done about this area. All right. I thank you. And I'm uh, turning back my time, a minute and 17 seconds. I want it duly noted, Mr. Chairman, to give someone else a chance. It is duly noted. The gentlewoman from uh, Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And Madam Secretary, thank you very much for taking your time to be here. I understand you have to go to the White House for a taping. And I would hope that you no, will. I'm with the Attorney General, but oh, oh, I am sorry. Then I was misinformed. But I, I would certainly hope that you will be able to return, and answer the questions that those on the committee have about the health care plan. Uh, could you give us a commitment to answer these before the markup? Let me, uh, Ms. Blackburn. I'm not going to take away from your time, and I'll give you an extra minute or so. I, I know that members are interested in getting timely responses, but we're not, we don't have the opportunity at this point to say that the Secretary is going to come back. So what I'm going to ask is that members submit their questions as quickly as possible, okay. and I would ask the Secretary acceptable. to respond to those questions as will, quickly will as possible. Will the gentleman yield? No, I, I want to get through this. Ms. Blackburn so has you yes, telling I, the witness not to answer the question. Parliamentary inquiry, are you telling the witness not to answer that question? No, no, I thought I said the opposite, which is that... No, you didn't. You told her not to answer is the way I interpret it. All right, let me start over again. 
Ms. Blackburn has the time. We're going to start Let again. Let her answer the question. And I would like to reclaim my time, Mr. Chairman, yes. as soon as you finish your What I'm saying is that the Secretary, we're not asking the Secretary to come back at this time. Mr. Chairman, so we're asking point, point of order. Yes. The Secretary is here to speak. Yes. On the single most important piece of legislation, most far-reaching piece of legislation in my 15 years in the United States Congress. Um, there are at least four members here, at least four, maybe five or more, who have not had an opportunity to question her and would like to be able to do so. We fully understand her schedule. She has important things to do. That's right. perfectly all right. But I think it would be reasonable for this committee, given the scope of the legislation that is moving, to ask the secretary to come back sometime before this bill moves for full, through full okay. committee. Okay. What I'm saying to you, and I will repeat again, is the following. The Secretary is here to give the Administration's response to the discussion draft. I am not asking her to commit at this time to come back because, for, first of all, I don't know her schedule and I don't know whether that's possible. I, Ms. Blackburn can ask, but I don't want, I don't want her to feel that she has to commit to this at, time, at this time because I don't know her order. schedule. Mr. Chairman? I will now ask Ms. Blackburn to point continue. Order. I think we're on my point And when order. she's done, uh, we're going to have to uh, ask the secretary to leave because she has to leave. So I'll go back to Ms. Blackburn. We'll start the clock again. It's the gentlewoman's time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Madam Secretary, I hope that we will be able to resolve this. You know, when, when my constituents talk to me about this issue, they are fearful of what may be included in this plan. And coming from Tennessee and you having been a governor, I think you can understand that. And when they hear remarks about it being deficit neutral or, uh, yes, deficit neutral, not increasing the debt, uh, you've made statements that it would be paid for. You've talked about reducing the itemized deductions. My constituents are very, very concerned about how this would be paid for. The other members of this committee have constituents who are equally concerned about this. Of course, our concern in Tennessee finds its nexus in the problems that existed with TennCare. I know governors have many times gone to school on what happened with TennCare and used that as an example of what they did not want to do. I would like to um, have a response from you. You can submit it to me in writing. You can begin the response here because I do have two questions on what you would see as the lessons learned and what you would not want to do that was from the ten, ten care template. What were the lessons that you learned in looking to that? Do you realize that you can't provide gold-plated all health care for free for everybody? Do you realize that a public option, which is government-run, government-financed, does not work in competition with a private option? That is one question I have to present to you. The second one is Medicare Advantage. And I know you have a heart for dealing with health care for seniors, and I appreciate that. My constituents, I have 56,000 seniors in Tennessee that are on Medicare Advantage. They very much want to keep those options, and I would like to hear from you what you envision a Medicare Advantage program looking like once the Obama plan goes into place, how you see that being, being delivered, what you think the options are going to be. It is of concern that those options are going to be restricted. And again, when individuals, when members of this committee sit here, when we hear from our constituents the panic that they feel, especially from seniors who say, look, I've paid What's going on with the mic? Do we know? My mic is not being touched. Oh, well, now it's okay. 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 But seniors are very fearful that they have paid into a system this was a part of their retirement security, a part of their savings, if you will, because it was money that the government took first right of refusal on their paycheck, took that money out. And now you've got somebody in their 70s, got, they've got their doctor set, they've got their Medicare Advantage set, they have their system in place, 
and they are seeing this savings devalued and finding out now it's all going to be a one-size-fits-all program and this causes tremendous concern from them so uh, your responses to what Medicare Advantage would look like would would be appreciated well congresswoman I'd be happy to answer both of those questions um, I can't do it now in person as you I said earlier you wanted to address the question and have me respond and I, I will do that promptly Thank you. I appreciate that. And at this time, I will uh, yield the balance of my time if I can, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I couldn't hear you. Who are you yielding to? Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts. Yes. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. Section 222 of the bill um, states that there is an amount that is going to be appropriated to the Secretary for the purposes of starting up the government plan, and that number is, quote, to be supplied in the text of the bill. Do you have any idea how much it will cost you to start up this government-run plan? No, sir, I do not. Um, you, you mentioned the President's repeated promise that the health reform bill will be deficit neutral. Are there any other deal breakers uh, for the administration? Does the legislation have to include a government plan? Does it have to include an individual mandate? Does it have to include an employer mandate? Can it increase taxes on families making under 250000 per year, for example? Um, sir, I, I think that the President's principles are um, that the plan needs to lower costs for everyone. Uh, needs to improve quality of care, needs to provide coverage for all Americans, um, and around those principles uh, that he and be paid for uh, within the period of time. Those are the fundamental principles that he has articulated, and he has, uh, you know, during the course of the discussion, had various proposals on some of those areas. I, I need to um, mention that I misspoke earlier to the congressman. The, proposal that he had for the itemized deduction return is for families making two hundred fifty or more, two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more. Um, I was corrected and I am happy to provide that additional information. So the gentleman's time is or the gentlewoman's time I should say has expired. Now again I'm just going to repeat, I know you have to leave and members will get back to you as quickly as possible with written questions and we, we would ask uh, Madam Secretary that you try to respond to those as quickly as possible. Very right. quickly. And thank you so much, really, for being here today. We appreciate yeah. your time. Thank, thank you. you. Now, let me explain. Um, we are going to adjourn the full committee, and then the subcommittee uh, reconvenes, the health subcommittee reconvenes, uh, reconvenes at 1 o'clock, and we have three panels um, for the rest of the day. So, Mr. Chairman. Time, Mr. Point of order. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yes. Just a point of order. Oh no, Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect to the secretary, this was billed as a legislative hearing on a draft. Yes. We have heard the secretary say that she did not participate in that draft preparation nor has she apparently, as she said, had the opportunity to read it, which is one of the uh, limitations that we all labor on in this time frame. I would simply urge you to urge our full chairman of the full committee that it would be almost mandated, I think, that she return to answer questions when we move to a legislative proposal. We are talking about a draft, but here when it moves to a legislative proposal, that we be allowed the opportunity to answer, I mean, to ask and to have answered questions. Um, you made the statement that she was speaking on behalf of the Obama administration as it relates to the draft. I, I know that she has done so in general terms, but I think there are some specifics that we would, should have the opportunity to ask specifics about. I would urge you to urge our chairman to ask her to return to this committee. I think it is due diligence for all of us to have the opportunity to explore these questions in person with her. Well, let me just say, I, I can't make that commitment, Mr. Deal, and, and for various reasons. And I think a part of it is the fact that we, um, you know, we're, we have a draft, and obviously there are going to be changes to that based on your input, the input from both sides of the aisle. And we really asked her here today to comment on, you know, what the administration thought about the draft. There never, you know, this, the bill is never going to be exactly what the president wants or, or doesn't want. 
but I just can't make that commitment. So uh, I appreciate your asking, but I can't. Point, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Point Mr. Chairman, order. you're saying you can't commit to ask? I can't commit the administration. Uh, no, no, no. We, his request was that you ask the no. full chairman. All right, look, she's been here. She's testified. You can ask her questions. I'm going to leave it at that. Well, Ms. And Mr. we're going to Chairman. adjourn and Mr. Mr. Chairman. the subcommittee hearing at 1 o'clock. There, are, there are 12 Republicans that have not even had a chance to speak or, and, or, and ask her questions. Members were told that she was going to leave at 12 o'clock. We understand we that. that. We're simply asking that she come back on a well, piece of major I can't make that commitment at this time. Well, so you're refusing, you're refusing to allow to. us to question? Can't make that commitment, and we're going to adjourn the committee at this time. Can you at least commit to ask the chairman? That's it. Gentlemen, look, I'm going to certainly express uh, your views, but I can't commit uh, the secretary to anything at this time. I'm going to express your views, and that's chairman. Just if I request a recorded vote on a motion to adjourn. We can ask for a recorded vote. You can make that request, sure. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? I <laughs> On the motion to adjourn? Um, let me just ask a par parliamentary point of view. Can you object to this? Uh, we already have a motion before us, which was a motion to adjourn. The, the chairman has entered that motion. I think what we'll do at this time, um, we had a vote and uh, it was defeated to adjourn. So at this time, we're just going to recess. Uh, we asked for, asked for a recorded vote. Coming up next on C-SPAN, critics of President Obama's health care proposal.